At age 14 in 1963, Nick Broomfield runs into Rolling Stones founder Brian Jones on a train. And he tells this story towards the beginning of his brand new documentary about Brian Jones called The Stones and Brian Jones, released earlier this month, from his perspective. And how it tell, talks about how shocked he was to learn of Brian Jones' death at age 27 in 1969, just, just six years later. But think about it also from Brian Jones' perspective, because Brian Jones had no idea that this 14-year-old kid he was looking at on that train would go on to create the definitive documentary about the man who was responsible for the Rolling Stones as a band even coming into being. And yet, hardly anyone knows who Brian Jones is today, as, as Nick Broomfield, who narrates the film, mentions at the very top. Uh, this guy was the heart and soul of, of the Rolling Stones. This was the guy who took out ads in the paper for, for saying that he was starting an R&B band and asking for people to come out and try out an audition for the band. And he had no idea what he was getting himself into because he ends up uh, courting not just the great bassist Bill Wyman, who, who was the Stones bassist right on through 1993. His last uh, studio record with the Stones was in 1989 on Steel Wheels. But... Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, who would soon go on to become the most brilliant songwriting duo this side of Lennon and McCartney, um, and the film goes into the feelings of inadequacy, uh, the, the, the self, um, self-doubt, the insecurities, um, th kind of the self-loathing at times is mentioned that, that Brian Jones underwent for a series of reasons that we'll get into. Um, it's just, it's 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 a fateful moment for Brian Jones to have innocently put out this ad saying, "Hey, I'm I'm starting an R&B band in, in the early 1960s," um, as it is fateful for the world itself because that's the reason the Rolling Stones came to exist and, and go on to become the greatest rock and roll band in the history of the world. Um, but this documentary, The Stones and Brian Jones, um, is is a must see for anyone with even a passing interest, not just in the Rolling Stones, but in 1960s culture, because th that story, that context, is in the backdrop of this entire tale about the doomed founder of Rolling St the Rolling Stones, Brian Jones, um, who was the first, when he died in 1969, Brian Jones became the first member of the so-called 27 Club, all of these tragic musicians um, who died at age 27. He dies in, in, on July 3rd, 1969. Later on, that death is, is followed by, by figures such as Jim Morrison, who dies on the same date two years later, July 3rd, 1971, uh, at age 27. By then, Jimi Hendrix dies at age 27. Janis Joplin dies at age 27. Decades later, Kurt Cobain dies at age 27. After that, oh, Amy Winehouse dies at age 27. It's this very tragic club of uh, brilliant musicians who died at that very age. Brian Jones was the first. He... Uh, he ends up um, inaugurating this doomed class of, uh, of, of, of tortured geniuses that um, died in the wake of Brian Jones's premature death. But the film opens with this, this really telling quote, which is, Brian was a casualty in the war between two generations. It's a quote by, I believe it's Stanley Booth, who was a, a Rolling Stones biographer. Um, obviously, you know, one of those generations is represented by his parents, right? Who, very similar to Jim Morrison, disapproved utterly and inflexibly of Brian Jones's obsession with music. The the uh, the extent to which Brian Jones rebelled against authority. The extent to which Brian Jones embraced jazz figures like Ca Cannonball Adderley. The extent to which Brian Jones embraced blues of figures in particular like Helen Wolf. Uh, his parents had no capacity to understand that music, the, the, the values that it represented, the culture that it initiated, none of it. There was utterly no ground on which they, they could stand jointly and understand each other by the time Brian Jones became a teenager. Jim Morrison's uh, father was the same way. Jim Morrison of The Doors had a military-type dad who would say things that were just today to to a contemporary audience that is aware of the doors aware of Jim Morrison's value as a singer and his talent 
um, find impossible to understand. His Jim Morrison's dad would say things like, "Well, he was a, he was a good singer. He was okay, but he was no Bing Crosby." <laughs> and and today we know Jim Morrison's voice to be one of the most distinctive, memorable, and instantly recognizable in the history of of rock and roll. I mean, he was one of the most distinctive vocalists of his generation. But this, and it tortured Jim just as it tortured Brian Jones that that his parents never found it within themselves to just be supportive. You don't. You know, I, it, you don't have to understand what he's doing, but maybe try to be supportive. It's easy for us in 2023 to say this um, because there was such a cultural and generational divide between generations that caused the conflagration of of cultural tumult that followed throughout the 1960s. In particular, 1967 becomes a flashpoint year, um, as this film uh, makes clear, with with the the, the heightening of, of drug culture, etc., the arrest of the Stones and the, the, the drug bust there that was really uh, Brian Jones's bandmates um, felt like he was to blame for that whole um, uh, unfortunate incident uh, that apparently really bothered Mick Jagger uh, one, uh, I think it was Marianne Faithful who does a series of very articulate very insightful very candid interviews throughout the film um, and says that that was something Mick Jagger never saw um, happening in his life he never felt you know something like that would the, the kind of disgrace of that moment would be something he'd have to deal with. Um, and his bandmates kind of blamed Brian Jones for that. But uh, going back to his the, 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 the casualty that Brian Jones was in the war between two generations, he sought his parents' approval tragically throughout his life and never got it. His father kicked him out of his house when he was 17 years old. And his father seems to have regretted that for the rest of his life or at the very least wrestled with the the magnitude impact um, and consequence of that decision and imagine you know once his his son dies um, in 1969 at age 27 a month after being fired from the Rolling Stones how deeply his father struggled with that when it was too late to to make amends with his son because his son was gone for good um, my goodness um, think about how it tortured you know, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and Charlie Watts and Bill Wyman to know that they had fired Brian Jones and a month later he was dead. Um, Marianne Faithful says, you know, contrary to maybe the appearances that Mick Jagger put on, in fact, he was rather upset by, by Brian Jones's death. You see an interview with Keith Richards, uh, a very young Keith Richards, uh, it's stock footage, um, talking about this and, and he kind of looks off to the side and looks down and his voice qu gets quieter and you can feel the remorse in in his body language and in his in his in his words um, in that moment. Um, this 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 really spooked the band. It was a terrible moment for them. Um, uh, so, you know, he he can't. He, Brian Jones. The he brings all of this self doubt and inadequacy into the band that I mean I'm I'm I don't want to play armchair or you know armchair psychologist here, but. It really seems like um, this disapproval of his parents was perhaps largely to blame for this inability that Brian Jones had to value himself, to be proud of having created this this band that came inordinately famous, yes, years before his death. He experienced the fame and the riches and the, and the recognition uh, with, with the Rolling Stones, but he... he didn't seem capable of feeling good about that in large part because his his parents just 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 weren't with it. Um, you know, I think of playwrights like Tennessee Williams struggled with this. His father never approved. In fact, his father told him that it was effeminate. That that Tennessee Williams preferred to write and and be creative rather than than watch you know or play football and things like that. Um, you know, uh, Tom Petty told told stories about his father not approving of of rock and roll until, of course, Tom became famous, and then all of a sudden his father was all about it. And, uh, and Tom's very candid about that in interviews and how convenient it was for his dad to suddenly become supportive of the lifestyle that it, formerly he had objected to. Uh, and and when you think about Brian Jones bringing those childhood traumas into his relationships with his bandmates. Um, Brian Jones was just, he was starting an R&B band. He was passionate about the blues. At, at one point, uh, he, is, he is called the, the, the band's premier blues purist. He thought that what the Rolling Stones were going to do was popularize blues for the masses, and he succeeded wildly in that. Millions of Americans became aware of the blues because of the Rolling Stones, and why? Because Brian Jones was the one really pushing the blues on the band and through the band onto the masses. Um, so, as the film says, millions of Americans became aware of this previously unknown black music by the likes of 
of uh, of of Helen Wolf and, and so many others that these guys idolized um, uh, uh, and uh, you know, uh, other other black innovators coming up at the same time, like Bo Diddley, have, uh, share uh, some of the spotlight in this film as well. Um, and it's clear that these guys all idolize him, Brian, more than than any of them. But what happens is that Mick and Keith, of course, um, Andrew Oldham, their this new manager that comes in, is is one of the voices that gets in their head and says, "Guys, you can't just be a cover cover band. You you, you got to write your own songs." They start writing their own songs, and by the time as the story goes, Keith Richards dreams up the rift of satisfaction in a hotel room in Clearwater, Florida while on tour in the States. Uh, that song be goes on to become this in incredible smash. To this day, it's one of the, the signature anthems of the entire rock moment, not just in the Rolling Stones canon. Uh, and Brian Jones starts telling uh, one of his girlfriends, and man, we got to get into these girlfriends because my gosh, what a tragedy there as well. Uh, that he couldn't stand the music. He was out of tune. It, it was distasteful. He didn't understand it. It was garbage. And, and you think, ah, you know, Brian, maybe you genuinely, genuinely felt that way. Or maybe it was just jealousy and, and envy that the, these guys you brought into the band, you know, childhood friends like, like Mick and Keith, uh, guys who signed up through auditions like Bill Wyman, uh, you know, they became genius songwriters and as one person puts it in the film he says they went on for 20 years so you know 20 year stretch there from 64 to 84 when they were just churning out rock classic after rock classic um i happen to like a lot of what they did as i i said on a previous video on this channel about their new album hackney diamonds after 1984 i think they they continue uh through the 2010s to 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 churn them out but uh be that as it may th the fact for brian jones was that once these guys start cranking out hits, uh, Satisfaction, Paint It Black, Ruby Tuesday, um, you know, Like a Rainbow, I mean, uh, all of these gorgeous, incredibly um, impactful, revolutionary tracks uh, in, in, that helped invent rock and roll. Um, it was just too much for, for Brian to swallow. Now, Brian being the original leader of the band, Brian being the founder of the band, Essentially, once Andrew Oldham, the new manager, comes in, once Mick and Keith uh, kick on the Jets as songwriters, he is displaced as leader of the band. Mick, being the instinctively natural frontman that he is and always has been, with that uh, unmatchable charisma that today at age, in his 80s now, as recently as, as the last year or two, has continued to bring to stage, running back and forth, trotting across the stage like a strutting rooster and dancing and... Uh, howling and all this he's still doing that he was still doing that in his late 70s okay um how, how are you going to match that it's it's to some extent emblematic of of george harrison trying to break out of the shadow of lennon and mccartney and the beatles when george knew and he's being prodded by guys like bob dylan telling him you're you're a great songwriter in and of uh, uh, um, in your own right you uh deserve recognition for for that um uh, Brian Jones, as one of his uh, girlfriends says in the f in the film, didn't understand that while Keith and Mick brought lots of charisma and and flash to the band, so did he, but he couldn't see that in himself. Are we going to blame his parents 100% for that? No. Um, you know, uh, to some extent, when you become an adult, you have to be accountable for your own responses to whatever traumas you may ex have experienced in your childhood. Brian's response was in part to put in his body every drink and drug he could get his hands on. Uh, one of his girlfriends says it was scotch and coke morning, noon, and night. Um, it was this drug, that drug, and the other drug, tranquilizers, uppers, downers, I mean everything. Uh, just destroying himself. And, and age, his last public appearance uh, with the Rolling Stones is spotlighted at one moment in the film. And you see this 26, 27-year-old kid with bags under his eyes like you you would might expect to see in a 70 year old man uh it's it's like when charlie parker died i think in his 30s it, it, the story about about his physical appearance at the time of his death was that of a man 50 years uh, more advanced in age than he actually was at the time of his death um it wasn't quite that dramatic with brian jones but it was definitely going down that path um had he made it into his 30s one almost shudders to think what he might have looked like or resembled physically with the path he was going down um and, and what's what's so tragic about brian's inability to just be his own parent be his own dad be his own mom as we all must in adulthood right i mean 
Uh, that's the terrible truth about adulthood, as I saw one therapist put it on, on, on YouTube not too long ago. Uh, no one's coming to save you. you got to find a way to save yourself. Uh, you got to find a way to sort of be responsible to the ways in which you responded to whatever traumas exist in your past. And, uh, and Brian Jones found one destructive means of, of response after another. What makes it doubly tragic is Brian Jones was the superior musician in the Rolling Stones. Brian Jones taught Keith Richards things about playing guitar. Brian Jones taught Mick Jagger how to play harmonica. Uh, Brian Jones was by far the most polished musician. It wasn't Keith. Keith gets all the accolades now, rightfully so. He, he be went on to become a guitar pioneer, no doubt about it. But Brian Jones taught Keith a thing or two. It was Brian Jones who was the most polished musician, and I love the scenes in this film that you're going to see with Bill Wyman, the only Rolling Stone, for whatever reason, Nick Broomfield actually visits and sits down with and chats with. And Bill Wyman seems to be rather warm and welcoming in these conversations, and, and I love these three very charming scenes when uh, earlier in the film he plays uh, the Stones' first sing uh, a fifth single, a blues single, uh, cover of Little Red Rooster. And firstly, Wyman explains that they were told that that was career suicide to cut a no one cut a blues single. It's hard to to really uh, put that one off as a, as a single. It wasn't going to work. Well, as Wyman says, true or not, it, this, they put out the single on Friday, and by Monday it was the number one. <laughs> um, but more more relevantly to Brian Jones is, it's just so it's almost adorable. Here's Bill Wyman, this man in his mid 80s, uh, sitting at his computer keying up Little Red Rooster for, for Broomfield to hear. And as you hear this very s simple, uh, sonically song, there isn't a whole of a lot, hell lot going on, but you hear Brian Jones kick in with that slide guitar, and Bill Wyman just goes, listen to that, listen to that. Who was doing that? What's anyone else in the band doing? It, he makes the song, and he just points to his computer, just like, in his mid-80s, he's still dumbstruck by... Brian Jones' innovation in that moment, Brian Jones' talent, that's that distinctive slide that creates that single, that makes that song, it's Brian Jones who, who helps turn that song into the hit that it became. Later on, a couple other tracks on which Brian Jones brings a flair to the Stones that they did not possess without him uh, was that sitar on, on Paint It Black. Um, you know, it's interesting that, that the Beatles... As recently as within the last several years, Paul McCartney's been out in the press saying, well, the Beatles, the, the Rolling Stones just copied what we did. Well, one girlfriend says that when she went over to Brian Jones's place, they never listened to the Rolling Stones, always listened to the Beatles. He was apparently a big Beatles fan. There's some uh, uh, snippets in there where Paul McCartney talks about Brian Jones actually showing up to a Beatles session with a saxophone, of all things, and, and they do play and record with him. Um, uh, they, he would listen to like the Righteous Brothers uh, when she went over to his place, but never the Rolling Stones. So perhaps there's some truth to what Paul McCartney says. And after he heard Jim Harrison bringing some sitar into their songs, uh, Brian Jones decided to do that too. Um, or maybe it would have happened on its own anyway because of the visionary as a multi instrumentalist that Brian Jones was. That's entirely plausible as well. Uh, but you know the sitar in, in Painted Black that makes that song. Ruby Tuesday. This is this is when you, you Bill Wyman as has long been known about Brian Jones, talks about um, Brian Jones' uh, predilection for just picking up anything and figuring out how to make it play well. Um, the, the alto recorder, the flute sound that you get on Ruby Tuesday, Bill Wyman again, he, he keys it up and he's playing it for Broomfield. He's like, oh. and he's like, listen to this. It's just, he just picks up a flute and learns, figures this little thing out. And it's this beautiful undercurrent threaded throughout the song Ruby Tuesday that the, that makes the song. It is not the song that it is, not even close without that element of sophistication Brian Jones brings to the song. And there's a fascinating interview with Eric Burden of the Animals when he says, when I heard that, that's when I realized there was someone with some real sophistication, vision, talent, and genius in that band. And that man was Brian Jones. Uh, so musical visionary by far the the most polished musician at, at at the inception of the band but my goodness uh i need a drink of water before we get into this next thing listen i didn't know this about brian jones um that he had at least five children each by a different woman by the time he was a, he was a 27 year old um drug addled uh, doomed founder of this pioneering band on the path literally toward death he had fathered at least five children, each by a different woman. And there's one, I, mean, I call this documentary heartbreaking, not just because Brian Jones 
his tragedy is heartbreaking. But the tragedies that he created in the lives of, of these families and these women that he would use and abandon. He, at one point in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in Broomfield's narration, he explains that Brian developed a pattern for adopting families, as he put it, impregnating their daughter, and then just ditching them. Over and over and over and over and over again, the man did this. This was yet another element of this totally reckless lifestyle of Brian Jones, who had previously been expelled from two schools. Uh, and it's, there's this one moment when one of his girlfriends says this. She goes, you know, Brian Jones, and she's sitting there with her son. Brian Jones' son. Her baby. And she's saying... Uh, Brian Jones just uses people and tosses them aside. Um, and if he has any friends, I, she says, I don't think they would really like him in any authentic way because of who he is. You could tell she's very disgusted and angry uh, with how she's been treated. Um, so, you know, th this, I don't know what the psychological explanation for that behavior might be. That's way above my pay grade. I'm no psychologist. Uh, I don't know, but my God, um, it just, 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 heartbreaking um, for, for these women and, and for their families. And the ruthlessness of Andrew Oldham, the Rolling Stones manager who would come in and when Brian Jones appeared to have fallen in love and be on the verge of marrying one of these uh, girls, he would say, no, no, no. You're not allowed to have a, a wife. You can't be married. You can't be seen to have girlfriends. You're in a rock and roll band. Um, and Linda Lawrence, who went on to raise Brian Jones' son with Donovan, one of my favorite songwriters. Apparently, to this day, they remain married. They got married in 1970. Um, says of Brian Jones that um, he had a choice to make. He had a choice to make between being a father and a, and a husband and pursuing fame. And he made his choice, and his choice was the latter. Um, and there's this heartbreaking scene when Linda Lawrence, by the time later in, in Brian Jones' life, when he gets involved with Anita Pallenberg, uh, this absolutely gorgeous, absolutely charismatic, uh, every bit as charismatic as Brian Jones was, um, uh, the dominant force in their tumultuous, um, tempestuous relationship fueled by drugs. Um, Linda Lawrence walks up to a hotel where they're staying because her son Julian, Brian Jones' son, she needs, she's out of money to, to, to raise this kid. And she's there to, to ask for help with that. And Brian Jones apparently and or uh, Anita just look at her through the window, laugh and, and reach withdraw into their hotel room and don't even come outside to see her. Um, so, you know, it's it's devastating. And, and Brian Jones, at one point, uh, Bill Wyman says that the, the troublesome thing about this guy was that he wasn't all bad and far from it. He, was, he could be a very sweet, charming gentleman. Uh, Linda Lawrence tells lovely stories about what a gentleman he was to her family. Um, uh, and, and other girlfriends, actually, in there um, tell similar tales. So, But there's also a scene where they show Brian Jones tapping out the ashes of a cigarette into Bill Wyman's hair in the middle of a press conference from behind Bill Wyman, and he has no idea while he's on camera that this has been done. Um, so things like that frankly, really pissed off his bandmates. Um, and in the interviews that Mick Jagger has done as recently as the 1990s, you hear still that bitter anger um, in, in some of the things he says about Brian Jones. Um, the fact is, Brian Jones lost the power struggle. Brian Jones, for whatever reason, couldn't write songs, and certainly not uh, of the caliber that uh, Mick Jagger and, and Keith Richards did. Mick Jagger confesses in the, in the, in the, in the, in the film at one point that Maybe we could have done more to try to coax that out of him. Maybe he could have been a songwriter, and maybe it was insensitive of us um, to not bother to do that. Um, you know, these were times when no one, uh, no one was going to come and, and save Brian Jones, and not much was really understood back then about things like mental illness, um, you know, drugs, and, and help for that. And you were on your own. You were left to your own devices in this in this culture moment back in the mid to late 1960s. Uh, and if you were strong enough to withstand it, as apparently Mick and, and Keith were, great. If you weren't, you were doomed. Um, there was, a, it seems, very little middle ground between the two. So, by the end of Brian Jones's life, he he's basically useless uh, as a member of the Rolling Stones. They can't even get him to the States because of drug busts preventing him from getting a work visa. So they end up firing him. And within a month... Um, he ends up being found motionless at the bottom of his pool on July 3rd, 1969 by um, his, his then girlfriend at uh, Cotchford Farms.
thereby becoming, as I said, the first member of this Tragic 27 Club. Um, and think about the, the, the multiple layers of this tragedy. All the women now who had no hope of, of a father being around for, at least not the biological father, being around for these at least five children that, that Brian had before his death. Um, the, 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 those broken, the families that were broken by this. Um, you think about the, how all that musical talent that was trashed by Brian Jones's extreme drug and alcohol addiction and inability to find his way through that. These tempestuous relationships with woman after, after woman um, that also helped destroy him. And his parents at one point, they went to see him not long before his death, the, the film recalls. Um, after his breakup with Anita Pallenberg, who goes on um, to end up have, uh, hooking up with Keith Richards. And that, as Keith himself admits in the film, was something for which Brian Jones never forgave him. And Keith is man enough to say, I don't blame him. Um, the, his parents think that, you know, Anita Pallenberg was the woman he was truly in love with. And losing her destroyed him. And his parents found him to be withdrawn into himself, a shell of himself. This once gregarious, outgoing, uh, interesting kid was um, uh, looking inward uh, and, and irretrievably, it seemed, in, in that way. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it also, you know, it's, it's kind of a... You, you think about the wasted talent. Uh, you think about the people who, who struggle to sort of the stones themselves, not blame themselves in any way. I mean, Neil Young had the, this happened to him when he fired Danny Witten from Crazy Horse after, you know, trying to rehearse with him to go on tour for an album as huge as Harvest was in 1972 with Heart of Gold and, and Needle and Damage done on it, fires a Danny Witten. And that night, Neil gets a call from the coroner saying that Danny Witten had overdosed. And Neil went on for years blaming himself for that. We don't know that the film doesn't doesn't mention much about really how Mick Jagger and Keith Richards over the course of the, their lives in the ensuing decades went on to feel about that to the extent to which they blamed themselves. Um, it seems like Bill Wyman and Charlie Watts were closest to Brian. They were the only people to show up to Brian Jones's funeral. Uh, Mick wasn't there. Keith wasn't there. Um, so it's, it's, yes, perhaps a, an all too familiar tale, but I'm glad the tale is being told about Brian Jones because the Rolling Stones exist because of that one man's initiative. Uh, and that's kind of an important thing, right? Uh, and it's kind of sad that, that despite that, as the film mentions at the top, hardly anyone knows who Brian Jones is today. I heartily recommend this film. It's called The Stones and Brian Jones. Brace yourself for the emotional impact. At times, it's rather, it's rather heartbreaking and disarming. Um, but I, I do think over the holidays this year, that if you've got any even passing interest in rock history and the Rolling Stones, whatever, uh, the 1960s culture, watch this film. Um, it, it's well done by a capable director who previously directed films about Kurt Cobain and Biggie Smalls. Um, it's a well done film. He, he doesn't sit down with any stone other than Bill Wyman, which I found to be unfortunate, but he explains in interviews that you can find online why he made that decision. Um, and it's understandable. Uh, but I hope you'll check out this film, and if you do, please let me know in the comments what you think about about this uh, Brian, the tragedy that was Brian Jones, and how it reverberated into the lives of those he affected. Um, uh, you know, I'm I'd love to hear uh, what you think of this excellent rock documentary, The Stones and Brian Jones. Let me know in the comments. I'd I'd um, I'd be happy to hear your perspective on on this film and Brian Jones's story.